Whoever wants to be great, stand up right now. Whoever wants to be great, stand up. Excellent. Now repeat after me. Repeat after me. If you want to be great and successful, if you want to be great and successful, you must walk hand in hand. You must walk hand in hand. Side by side. Side by side. With great and successful people. With great and successful people. All right, have a seat. All I did for about seven years of my life was attempt to try to find out what makes the great great. That's all I ever did. When I left Northwestern University in 1984 with a PhD in hand, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I certainly knew what I didn't want to do. I did not want to teach. I did not want to go into corporate America. I didn't want to go to the foreign service like many of my colleagues. I guess sort of subconsciously I wanted to find out the keys to success. So I carved out a list initially of about 40 people that I was going to meet and interview and notice at point blank range trying to find the keys to success. That list of 40 swelled to almost 100. And all I wanted to do was find out what makes the great great. And I'm just here to tell you some of the things. When I asked Don King, what makes the great, great Don King says, if you overfill your place, people will come see you. If you set yourself on fire, the world will come see you burn. What makes the great, great? When I interviewed Mae Jemison, the first black woman in space, I said, Dr. Jemison, what is success? She says, success is lifestyle. Life is God's gift to you. Style is what you do with it. What makes the great, great? When I interviewed Ben Carson, arguably black America's number one neurosurgeon, Dr. Carson said to me, he said, think big, think stretch, think global, think quantum leaps, but by all means, think. And that is the key. What makes the great, great? Have you found it? Percy, Percy Sutton of Inner City Broadcasting said to me, he said, young man, if you have but one wish, let it be for a dream. What makes the great, great? Henry Parks of Park Sausage said to me, he said, young man, in one hand I have a dream, in the other hand I have an obstacle. Which one grabs your attention? What makes the great, great? The few moments that I had with Reverend Knight, he said to me, he says, I know the key to greatness. I said, Reverend Knight, what is it? He said, mine, your own business. Hmm. I said, Reverend Knight, you want to run that by me again? I said, yeah. He said, mine, your own business. Bob Johnson of BET said to me, I said, Mr. Johnson, what is success? What is greatness? He said, life is a grindstone. Whether it grinds you down or polishes you up depends on what you are made of. I asked Louis Farrakhan, I said, I said, Minister Farrakhan, what is wealth? He said, poor is the man who all he has is money. What makes the great great? And then I came full circle, full, excuse me, full circle to Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson says, you may not be responsible for getting knocked down, but you're certainly responsible for getting back up. What makes the great great? Well, in short, it's a sense of destiny, as Peter Daniels say. It is a sense of destiny. And anybody can have a sense of destiny by following five keys. Number one, focus on that which you desire most. Number two, emulate somebody that you can admire. Number three, develop a gratitude attitude. Give thanks for the things that you do have. Don't worry about the things that you don't. Number four, recognize that strength grows out of struggle. And last but not least, dedicate yourself to lifelong learning. Readers are leaders. The average black male in American society spends more than $500 on the outside of his head. Haircuts, shaves, dental work, but spends less than $50 a year on the inside of his head. And I applaud everyone here today. Readers are leaders. All you are is a mental being. All causation is mental. Everything happens to you twice in life. First the inner, then the outer. First the thought, then the thing. First the mental and then the physical. And to the extent that you control what goes on the inside of your life, you'll control what goes on the outside of your life. <coughs> readers are leaders. You can be, have, or do anything you want in this society. And I tell people, do not become a know-it-all. Don't have preconceived notions. It's like the story of three men who are about to be executioned. And each one of them were granted one last word to say before they are about to be guillotined to death. The first one to approach the chopping block is a doctor. The doctor puts his neck on the chopping block and the executioner says, Doctor, do you have any last words? And the doctor says, yes. Physician, heal thyself. Right then the guillotine blade comes down and stops two inches from the doctor's neck. Everybody out in the audience says, surely this is a sign from above. This man is innocent. Let him go free. The next one to approach the chopping block was a priest. The executioner says to the priest, he says, 
Father, do you have any last words? And the priest says, yes, keep the faith. Right then the guillotine blade came down and stopped one inch from the priest's neck. Everybody out in the crowd says, surely this man is innocent. Let him go free. The last person to approach the chopping block was a know-it-all. And the executioner says, sir, do you have any last words? And the know-it-all says, yes. If you tighten the two bolts on the left, the guillotine will work as planned. <laughs> Don't be a know-it-all. The information is there. The material is there. Focus on your God-given talents. Use this billion-dollar brain, this mind that you have, and use it for your own personal good. You see, the Bible says the first shall be last and the last shall be first. We in the black community have been trained to believe you go to any pastor and say, Pastor, what does that mean, the first shall be last and the last shall be first? Well, the pastor will say, well, that's living proof that black America will one day be first. All these years we've been last, but one day, if you read it right here in the Bible, we shall be first. Well, it doesn't mean that. The first shall be last and the last shall be first doesn't mean that at all. You see, we live in a consciousness that says, I will not believe it till I see it. In other words, when you show me the physical, then I'll believe it. The Bible says put that last. See, the physical, which is first, will now become last. And the mental, which is last, will now become first. You see with your mind's eye, you get a dream, a vision, something that you want to do, and you see with your mind's eye because your physical eye will lie to you. I interviewed scores of achievers. You name it. I spent a day with Al Sharpton. I spent a day with Don King. Susan Taylor, Vessens Magazine, Mae Jemison, Percy Sutton, you name it, and I had the pleasure to talk to that individual, and I found four common cores, no matter who I interviewed. Number one, they dreamed big dreams. They had a dream, a plan, a vision, something they wanted to accomplish so desperately with their life. Number two, they were inner directed versus outer directed. In other words, they didn't live life at the circumference, they lived life at the center. And they weren't so quick to believe well-meaning friends or family who said, you can't do this or you can't do that. See, that's what Robert Frost meant in his poem, Two Roads Diverge in the Wood. And I, I took the one less traveled by. You are unique. You cannot succeed being like everybody else. You must take that lonely road. And that's why I have in my book that the opposite of success is not failure. The opposite of success is conformity. So many times we conform to the wishes, the norms, and the mores of others. Number three, these individuals flat out refuse to be average. They committed themselves to personal excellence. Now again, you can be, have, or do what you want in this society, but I tell people, don't be average. See, average is worst of the best, it's best of the worst. It's top of the bottom, bottom of the top. Society remembers the achiever. Society will even remember the man or woman who fell short of the mark. But nobody remembers the man or woman who is average. When you die, they'll put on your tombstone, here lies somebody that's just average. <laughs> and last but not least, these individuals flat out refuse to fail. Now, I'm not saying that they didn't fail. Many times they actually failed their way to success. But no one was going to stop them. And again, going back to my book, that's why I say that success is a statistical event. That's all it is. You encounter, when you encounter your setbacks, when you encounter your adversities or that thing that sets you back, do not personalize your failure. And failure is never a failure until it is accepted as such. And one way that you can overcome any failure, one way that you can ensure that you will rally forth and redouble your efforts, is that when you hit that setback, when you hit that adversity, ask yourself, what can I do better next time? Success is a statistical event. Why am I Dr. Kimbrough? <laughs> because I'm smarter than you guys? No. I got a PhD because I got more college hours than you have. <laughs> when you get the same number of college hours I have, you'll have a PhD too. You doubt that? See, I interviewed Marva Collins in Chicago and I asked Marva, I said, Marva, if I put you under a microscope, what is the one or two things that I would find out over and over in your character? You know what she told me? She says, I learned 15 new vocabulary words a day. Now I can take a high school dropout from inner city Oakland and for five years teach that individual 15 new vocabulary words a day. And after five years, they may not be Marva Collins, 
But I guarantee you, they'll either be on somebody's college campus or in somebody's high school, either teaching, teaching English, literature, or reading, whatever. Success is a statistical event. The average individual in our lifetime, or the average individual in society, gets four ideas a year. Any one of which, if they had the guts, the courage, the fortitude to follow them through, would make that person financially independent. So why don't we do it? Well, a whole host of things. Low self-image. You know, we don't believe in ourselves. Lack of faith. I'm here to tell you that anybody, 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 it's not a question of can you succeed, it's a question of will you succeed. And that's it in a nutshell. That's all success is. That's all I ever did. When I left school, I didn't want to become a top surgeon. <laughs> I didn't want to become a president of a firm. I didn't want to go to the moon, fly to the moon like Mae Jemison. All I ever wanted to do was to position myself in a position where if there was anybody, anybody in the United States, in the 48 contiguous states or throughout the country, anybody who wanted to know anything about blacks, success, wealth, achievement, or leadership, they had to call me. And that's all I ever did. That's all I ever did. It took me six years to write the book. Six years to write the book. And uh, I wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for my lovely wife, Pat. Pat, stand up. <laughs> See, I don't mind telling you the truth. I mean, if it wasn't for her, <laughs> I'm just telling you the way it is. If it wasn't for her, I would not be standing here. Six years it took me to write the book. When I started interviewing these achievers, I guess I had interviewed about 20 of them. And W. Clement Stone of the Napoleon Hill Foundation caught wind of what I was doing. Now, who is Napoleon Hill? Napoleon Hill is arguably the number one success, motivational, inspirational writer that this country has ever produced. If you took Napoleon Hill and put him in a foot race with all the men and women who you see out on the circuit today, if you put them in a mile foot race, get them all, line them up, put them in a mile foot race with Napoleon Hill. By the time Napoleon Hill crossed the finish line, he would be so far out in front, if he turned over his shoulder, he couldn't even tell you who's in second place. Napoleon Hill was a white gentleman born in utter poverty in Virginia who carved out a very illustrious speaking and writing career for himself. He wrote 16 books. Six of his books are still on the market today. His all-time two bestsellers, his first one was called Laws of Success, but in the 1930s he published Think and Grow Rich. At last count, that book has sold more than 16 million copies. More than 250,000 blacks have read the original Think and Grow Rich and use it as a springboard in their life. The last thing Napoleon Hill ever attempted to do in 1970 was to write a black version of Think and Grow Rich. He gets 100 pages into the manuscript and he dies of a stroke. He is 83 years old. Those 100 pages sat on the desk of W. Clement Stone for 16 years until I walked into his office. Now, who is W. Clement Stone? W. Clement Stone is the president of the Napoleon Hill Foundation. In the 1970s, he was the wealthiest individual in the world. He was number one on the Forbes 400 richest list. And he caught wind of what I was doing. He called me up and he says, young man, when can you come to Chicago? I'd like to meet you. My wife and I flew to Chicago, met W. Clement Stone. And prior to that, I told Mr. Stone, I said, you know, he asked me why I got involved in this project, why, why I was going around the country interviewing successful black achievers. And I said, Mr. Stone, I wanted to find the answers to two questions. Question number one, why does one man or woman fail while another succeeds? And question number two, why is one individual rich and wealthy while another is impoverished? And at that time, W. Clement Stone said to me, he says, well, based on what we see in here, we want you to push your book aside and we want you to finish this book. And I said, what book? And that's when he placed in my hands the last 100 pages written by Napoleon Hill. And I looked at it, and I looked at Mr. Stone, and I said, well, I said, I can't finish this book. He said, why not? I said, well, I want to finish my book. He said, put your book aside. And I said, on, second of all, I can't finish this book. And he says, why not now? And I said, well, I don't have any money. I said, I'll finish it under one condition. 
if you pay me, if you give me some type of financial inducement, if you underwrite me, then I'll write, then I'll finish the book. And then W. Clement Stone said something to me I'll never forget. He said, young man, if you really want to find out the answers to the question, why one person fails and another succeeds, if you really want to find out the answers to the question, why one person is rich and wealthy while another is impoverished, it is in this laboratory that you must find it. He said, no, I'm not going to pay you. And for six or seven years, I crisscrossed the nation. I was hit with every type of financial situation, you name it, I was hit with it. Didn't lose one car, I lost two. Couldn't begin to tell you how many times my water, gas, electricity was cut off. So I just showed you I had a wife and three kids that I had to care for. See, the Bible says it came to pass, not it came to stay. <laughs> So I think I'll just stop my little talk right here and open it up for Q&A and use that as a springboard. If anybody has any questions, we'll just take off from there. Yeah. What do you come as now with the passing of Reginald Lewis, who really in the sweep was one of the richest, if I can't, the richest of Americans. You hear about Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, and he certainly got as America's richest. Certainly, without the Go ahead, Lines. Best, best title was he was former CEO of BFS. No milestone about being the richest black man in America. Well, he, um, <clears throat> they had a nice piece in USA Today. They had a couple of pieces in uh, Wall Street Journal. I was interviewed by um, a writer from the Gannett Services about the same question. As a matter of fact, I was in Denver and I had a, a phone interview. Um, Reg Lewis is one of the few individuals who I did not get a chance to interview. Very private man. I tried for more than two years to get through his lieutenants. The closest I got to Reg Lewis, I had a lengthy conversation with his director of communications. And I did um, um, have a nice conversation in an interview with a gentleman up in New York who helped Reg Lewis put together the deal. I just asked him the mechanics of the deal. Very private individual. Um, it's a real life tragedy that we didn't get to enjoy some of the fruits of what Reg Lewis did. But Reg Lewis was not the first one to put together a leverage buyout. That honor goes to Bruce Llewellyn. The first leverage buyout in the United States was by a black man, Bruce Llewellyn, in the 1970s with Fedco Foods. An interesting anecdote, I did get a chance to spend some time with Bruce Llewellyn, who was arguably one of the wealthier people in the United States. But here is a black man, Bruce Llewellyn, before I get more on Reg Lewis, who came within an eyelash of owning the New York Yankees. See, years ago when Faye Vincent ascended to the position of commissioner of baseball, it didn't take Faye Vincent any time to throw George Steinbrenner of the Yankees out of baseball. Steinbrenner's coming back in March. The day after, the day after Faye Vincent tells George Steinbrenner of the Yankees to pack his bags, Bruce Llewellyn calls his secretary into his office. Secretary takes down the following letter. Takes the letter, puts it in a FedEx envelope. FedEx is the envelope to George Steinbrenner. George Steinbrenner gets the FedEx envelope the next day pulls out the letter and the letter reads, Dear George, write any dollar figure you want in the enclosed check. I must own the Yankees. You all are doing that. Dear George, write any dollar figure you want on the enclosed check. I must own the Yankees. Steinbrenner says no, they're not for sale. But getting back to Reg Lewis, one thing Reg Lewis did do he was a paragon for business excellence for us. Here's a guy, went to Virginia State. From Virginia State, he specifically went to Harvard to study under a law professor by the name of Lewis Loss. Lewis Loss is an expert in leverage buyouts, LBOs. And see, Reg Lewis had a plan. He went to Harvard to study under the best, and he was going to take what he had and use it. He was going to take the knowledge that he was going to gain from Harvard and put it in action. So, uh, you know, we have other capable leaders, particular entrepreneurs, 
and it is up to us, I guess, writers like myself, or every chance that we can get to shine and let that light on these individuals where they can pass along this baton called success. See, you ask any track coach who has coached a relay race, the track coach will tell you that a relay race is either won or lost, and in the swift interchange, it takes to pass the baton. In that swift interchange, it takes to pass the baton between runner and runner, that will make up the critical difference of the race. Now, black America has many swift and capable runners. Lane number one, we got Oprah Winfrey. In lane number two, we got John Johnson. In lane number three, we got Earl Graves. In lane number four, we got Anesta Proko. Black men and women who have run the race of their lives, all right? Who have run the race of their lives. They've come around the turn, they're coming down the straightaway, they're holding this baton called success and achievement, and we just have to make sure that there is another generation that is fit and focused in those lanes to take that baton. Hopefully, in the 50 years that Reggie Lewis was here, we were able to do that. Hmm. I have a little, a little, a little, a question. Yeah, no question. <laughs> Unless I ask my wife for money. <laughs> yeah, I asked my wife for money. I said, Pat, give me some money. She said, I gave you a dollar last week. What you do? <laughs> I know, it can't take me anywhere. Go ahead. Okay, you gave me the note. But my question is, and I like, like your book, and I always say, think, 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 okay? That's right. Think big. That's right. I really do. I think really big and crazy. I think. Uh, but then I don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. I think I want to be famous. Okay. But then I always sit back and wonder, you know, my dream is like I want to show for all famous people. And yeah. God has been opening that door for uh -huh. me. Like Uber Charles, Mandela, yeah. Jesse Jackson. I've yeah. met all of these people. Uh -huh. But then I want to be famous. And I would like to write a book about, you know, I don't know. Well, it sounds like you're trying to find your area of excellence, and there's four keys. There's four keys that you can use to find your area of excellence. Number one, you know, ask yourself, ask yourself these four critical questions in order to find your area of excellence. Number one, you know, ask yourself, what is it that I love to do? I love to drive. Okay. I really do. I love children. What is it that I love to do? What do I have a passion for? What can I throw my whole heart and soul into? But yeah, question number two. That's question number two. Ask yourself, what would I do for free? What would I do without financial reward? What would I do without financial remuneration? Because when you're doing what you love to do, and you would do it for free, your work is your play. And if your work is your play, you'll never work a day in your life. See, the, the two times that I interviewed John Johnson, I noticed him at point blank range, and I couldn't tell when he was working, and when he was playing. You see, it was totally symmetrical. I couldn't tell. Question number three, ask yourself, what comes easy to me, but difficult to somebody else? What do I do so effortlessly and so flawlessly? As Oprah Winfrey says, it's like breathing. And we all have these areas and these zones. And question number four, ask yourself, or ask your friends, your family, your neighbors, what do you see me as? What do you think I would be good at doing? You answer those four questions openly and honestly, you'll have identified your area of excellence. Now, here's the good news. The market pays superior rewards for superior performance. <coughs> Any other questions? How do you get to that superior uh, performance? I mean, you have the idea. Mm -hmm. You know what you want to do. Mm -hmm. You might know how to get there, you might not. Mm -hmm. you know, how do you get that push, that drive? How do you go from one place to another uh, blindly, not necessarily not seeing, but I mean, just this is the way I have to go. Yeah. This is the way I have to go. I have to do it. Well, I mean, first of all, you don't get involved in anything that you can't be excellent at it. Right. You don't get involved in anything that you can't be excellent at it. See, when you are excellent at what you are doing, you never have to worry about employment. You never have to worry about an income if you are excellent at what you're doing. If you are number one in your field, the market will seek you out. If you are number one. I mean, for, for six or seven years, I crisscrossed this country and I couldn't find a job with a road map. I mean, I did anything. I mean, one year, I, could, I lived in Atlanta. One year, I couldn't find any work in Atlanta while I'm engaging this project. The only job I could find is in Chicago. For one year, I lived in Chicago completely away from my family. And every other Friday, when my boss from the consulting firm gave me my check, I put it in the mail and sent it back to my family. 
But now, you become excellent at what you're doing, people seek you out. I mean, I can hit up with scores of opportunity. Scores of opportunity. You see what I'm saying? Yes, but how do you get into a position where people can see it? Okay, no, but I see what you're saying right now. It goes back to that age-old adage where practice makes perfect. Except that adage is wrong. Practice does not make perfect. Perfect practice. Perfect practice makes perfect. If you're practicing anything but perfection, you're perfecting an error. So you set a goal. And when you take action on that goal, step back from that goal and ask yourself, how is my aim? How is my aim? If you set a goal to hit that bullseye and you throw the dart over here, you step back and you measure the difference. That's why I say in my book that your goals must be conceivable. Goals must be believable. Goals must be achievable. And last but not least, goals must be measurable. Because what gets measured gets done. What gets measured gets done. And you should make sure that you keep your goals in front of you at all times. I mean, you're sitting here listening to me right now. If I was to break in any of your homes or your apartments, I'm going to ask you this question to do it out. I'm not I'm just playing devil's advocate. Smile! <laughs> you know why you pick me, man? I didn't do that. I knew I shouldn't have come. <laughs> you're here listening to me now, right? Uh -huh. if, I broke in, okay, if I broke into your home or apartment, okay? And suppose I decided to shave in the same mirror that you put your makeup on every morning. Mm -hmm. Would I see your goals? Yeah. If I reach for a glass of water in your icebox where you may keep your bacon and eggs or whatever, would I see your goals? If I took off my jacket in the same closet that you take off your blouse or whatever, would I see your goals? If I got tired and slept in your bed on the same side that you sleep on and rolled out the same side you roll out every morning, what would be the first thing that I would see? Would I see your goals? So what thou seest that thou beest. And that's all I had. When times got difficult, I leaned on my dreams. When people slammed the door in my face, I would just think about my dreams over and over and over and over again. When they cut my water off or take my car and tell me, hey, this won't work and that won't work, hell, I would go down to the bookstore. I went down to B. Dalton's bookstore in Atlanta, Georgia, and asked for my book years before it was finished. I had a bad day. Somebody kicked me in my mouth. Yeah. And I would do that routinely. Go down to B. Dalton's bookstore and ask for my book. Go up to, say, uh, go up to the desk and I asked the manager, I said, do you have that book? It's about blacks and achievement. And, uh, and she would say, who's the author? And I said, some guy named Kimbrough. And she would go to books in print and look it up and couldn't find it there. And then she would go to the microfiche and couldn't find it there. And then she would look on her computer. And a couple times they even called Ingram. Ingram in Nashville, Tennessee, the distributor. She said, now who's the author? I said, some guy named Kimbrough. She said, are you sure about the time? I said, yeah, the book is number one. It's taking the country by storm. <laughs> And I did that several times, two, three years before the book came out. And don't you know, I had a, when the book came out, I had a, a very, very, very successful book signing in that same book. <laughs> and it was a book, and the author's name is Kimbrough, and it is a bestseller, and everybody has it. So I don't care what others say. I, mean, I don't care what others say. What you say, the most important conversation you'll ever have is the one you have with yourself. I can't control what the rest of these guys are going to do. I can't control that. I, the only thing I control is what goes on in here. And I can live my life in advance. That's all it is. You just a, All you are is a blank sheet of paper in the mind of the Creator. You come into this existence with two words. Our Creator gives us two words, I am, and leaves it up to you to fill in the blanks. Some folks say I'm rich. Some folks say I'm, health, I'm healthy. Some folks say I'm prosperous. Some folks say, hey, oh, I am wonderful, whatever. And then you got a whole contingent of other folks say, hey, I am downtrodden. I am down and out. I am poor. I'm impoverished. You fill in the blanks. Our Creator doesn't know who's rich and who's poor. Our Creator doesn't know if, if John Johnson is worth $150 million and T. Boone Pickens and Ross Perot are billionaires and some poor black woman in Oakland is, you know, tried, you know, trying to put an existence together. Our Creator doesn't know that. The only thing our Creator knows is the thoughts that you send out. And you can put anything that you want. See, that's what's meant in the Bible by Judgment Day. So the Bible tells you Judgment Day. We've been taught Judgment Day. If we've been good, we go to some place called heaven. We've been bad, the Creator pulls a trap door on us and we go to hell. And that's not Judgment Day. Judgment Day is a day in which all your thoughts become things. If you are a different Judgment Day to think different thoughts. Right now, this is, ju this is my Judgment Day. Because I thought these different thoughts.
about how you begin writing a book. How I began? You know, like, if a person wants to write a book, like, you know what you're... What you want to write? Do. You want to write? Then write every day. Okay. You write every day. Okay. You write every day. Okay. You write every day. Okay. And you can ask Pat. She's sitting right next to you. This time I sat at my computer, and I got three computers at home. <laughs> and I would sit at that computer, and sometimes the ideas did not come. And when, I, when I'm slow, when I'm right, like I got a deadline now, I got a book coming out in November in which I got to edit some things on, and I'm just praying the ideas come. Mm -hmm. Because it's not a pretty sight being in the house with me with no ideas coming. <laughs> I can tell you that. I mean, there was one time on this meditation book, or several times in the meditation book, the ideas just didn't seem to flow. And one time I got up out of the bed at 3.30 in the morning, and Pat heard all this rustling. And she said, man, what are you doing? And she cut the light on, and she says, you're on your knees praying for an idea, aren't you? I said, that's right. <laughs> <coughs> Write every day. Writing means rewriting. <laughs> you want to be a writer? You're a writer. You surround yourself with the image of yourself. Why is my book a bestseller? Because I did one thing right? No. My book is a bestseller because I did 90 things right. Besides interviewing all these black achievers, I interviewed six best-selling authors. Asking them, how do you write a bestseller? I interviewed Charles Garfield, who wrote Peak Performers. I interviewed Harvey McKay. I interviewed George Gilder, who wrote Spirit of uh, Enterprise. I interviewed Robert Shook. All best-selling authors. And I asked them, how do you write a bestseller? And they told me. And I put it all down on a piece of paper, and I just did it. You see, Booker T. Washington says, success always leaves footprints. Booker T. Washington said, success always leaves footprints. It's not rocket science -y. You surround yourself with the image of yourself, and you never, ever take advice from anybody who's not in life where you want to be. <laughs> Would you? I was on a radio talk show and I don't know what town it is and the guy says, anybody have any questions for Dr. Kimbrough? And this guy called up and says, yeah, I got a question for the doctor. I want to be a millionaire. And I said, that's easy. Take a millionaire to lunch. He said, well, why should I take a millionaire to lunch? He's a millionaire. Uh, he ought to take me to lunch. I said, no, 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 no. See, you take the millionaire to lunch to find out what the millionaire knows. Millionaire doesn't even know what you know. He's already been broke. You need to find out what he knows. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> what, what artifact did you have a goal that you work and financially saying I have a goal and I'm trying to reach it, but it's, to you it feels like it's taking forever to reach that goal? Well, I don't, I don't know what it's going to take for you to reach your mission, okay. but if you're not in life where you want to be, or you're not in life where you need to be, it's because of one thing and one thing only. Your goals are not clearly defined. That is it. That is it. There's black men and women that came from dire circumstances. I mean, when I heard some of these stories, see, I'm not telling anybody in this room that you got to become a Rhodes Scholar like Bonnie St. John in Los Angeles and you have to do it on one leg. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm not telling anybody in this room they've got to become a Booker T. Washington. How old was Booker T. Washington when he found a Tuskegee? 24. What were you doing at 24? And he went door to door. Booker T. Washington went door to door and raised six million dollars. I'm not telling you to do that. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I'm not telling you you got to go through the nonsense that John Johnson went through to start Negro Digest that became Ebony. I mean, when I interviewed that guy and I went to S.B. Fuller's offices in Chicago, they told me that John Johnson used to, Fuller was, was Johnson's mentor. He used to come into Fuller's offices darn near crawling on his knees, crying to Fuller. No one's buying the magazine. Mr. Fuller, I did what you told me to do and it just ain't working. Fuller says, shut up, man. Go out there and sell the things. <laughs> See, A.G. Gaston did the same thing to me. After I got through spending a day with A.G. Gaston, tears just came out of my eyes because of my financial situation. And I was cutting off my tape recorder and putting my papers into my, my uh, briefcase. And Mr. Gaston said, young man, what in the world is wrong? And I told him all the things that I was I said, Mr. Gaston, I wouldn't blame my wife if she left me. I, I don't have any money in this now. So he hands me a Kleenex from behind his desk. <laughs> he says, tell me when you're through. 
<laughs> I'll tell you what I'm doing. You didn't hear what I said, Mr. Johnson. He said, young man, he says, <laughs> that the successful individual must be tested in the furnace of adversity. Fear not, young man. Keep doing what you're doing. But if you are satisfied with where you are in life, then step aside for the man who isn't. Mm -hmm. Brother, I straightened up. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I wanted you to... Uh, Mold better! <laughs> um, I was going to keep a comment on risk aversion in the black community. Um, how, any suggestions on how, strategies on how we might minimize? Well, sometimes it's risky not to take a risk. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Sometimes it's risky not to take a risk. I mean, life is risk and reward. Just coming here is one risk. I mean, you can't escape risk. It's how you look at it. You see what I'm saying? Is there a risk aversion? Um, I choose to say not, particularly in the black community. Okay? Um, but there's loads of opportunity. I mean, life is one big risk. And all success is, all opportunity is, is a crater knocking on your subconscious asking you if you want more. But you must have faith. You must step out there on faith. All my neighbors laughed at me. All. I had a 1981 beat up Datsun 510. It was silver when we bought it, turned gray, and faded. Yeah. We used to go to cocktail parties with our neighbors, and everybody would huddle in the kitchen. They would say, What's gray and black and lies in the grass? <laughs> and I was so stupid, I said, What? They said, Go call. I ain't laughing now. <laughs> Life is one big risk. You must have faith. One quick, two types of faith. Faith in self, faith in others. See what I'm saying? Faith in self, faith in others. And what I found out from the achievers that I interviewed, the faith that we so blindly entrust in others, they keep for themselves. For instance, I flew from Washington, excuse me, I flew from Atlanta to Denver, San Francisco, right? When I got on the plane, I didn't go into the cockpit of the airplane to see if the pilot had his license to take this thing off and land it. No, I put faith in it. Sometimes I question that faith. We hit some turbulence. I'm staying at the Oakland Park Hotel or whatever. We stay on the 20th floor, right? Get on the elevator and go up the 20th floor. You know, I have the faith that the elevator is going to take us up there. I don't call the hotel and see what's the last thing this thing's been checked out. You see, that's faith that I have that I'm putting in somebody else. We all have that faith. All high-achieving men and women, they keep that faith for themselves. Like Walter Turner, the Harlem Boys Choir, he said, no, I'll pull this off. It took him 25 years. I asked Walter Turner what a success. He said, hearing the voices of my men. And that brother is mentally tough. It's so quiet in school, you can go in there and just hear grass from As soon as you walk in the Harlem Boys Choir, their head offices, he's got a big sign. Hats off, discipline is the key. Next question. Uh, it just sounds like you have a lot of uh, spiritual beliefs and how to believe in God. Yeah. And you mentioned faith. Did you find that as you interviewed other successful people also believe in God? Oh man, there were times that I thought I was in church with some of these folks. And I, like I said, I spent a day with Al Sharpton. I didn't get that feeling from him. But I certainly got that feeling from Susan Dunn. No, I'm being honest. I'm not saying that he isn't. I just, you know, he was, you know, he liked to have a good time. But with Susan Taylor, with um, A.G. Gaston, with, all oh, George Johnson, Johnson Products. Woo! Man, Wally Amos. Um, who else? Oh, of course, Ben Carson. Um, Did you interview Bill Cosby? I was on Bill Cosby's show, and I got a chance just to ask him a few questions. I mean, he's surrounded by a sea of lieutenants, but uh, Bill Cosby is very funny. I mean, just the, the, the little time that I had with him, you know, I just got a feeling he just um, he applauded what I was doing. He told me to keep on going, and um, just a very nice guy. Same um, with uh, George Halsey of Amway was another quick George Halsey story spent a day with him in North Carolina and talk about spiritual okay very spiritual individual and he just had something that he just wanted to give back to the community and so 
Uh, he took me out to lunch, and we were coming back from lunch. We went, we drew, we drove through the sort of seedy part of Greensboro, North Carolina. And there were some brothers hanging out on the street, you know, drinking wine. It was a work day, it was, I don't know, it was a month, either a Monday through Friday or something like that. And so I said, Mr. Hall, I said, what's going through your mind when you see this? And he says, man, he says, if I could just have five or ten minutes with each of them, man, just let them, you know, explain to them that it's a better way. You see what I'm saying? Like this. So at the end of the day, I'm wrapping my stuff up and I'm collecting my papers and I had my coat off. I was relaxed. And as I was leaving, I said goodbye to um, George's wife, Ruth, and I said goodbye to his kids and I had my jacket slung over my shoulder. And I shook hands with Mr. Hall and I said, thank you for, you know, allowing me to come in your life and interview you and spend this time with you. And I'm walking out the door. Uh, George Hall, he says, oh yeah, young man, I just got one request. And I said, sure, Mr. Hall, whatever I can do. He says, don't quit. And so I had the, my jacket over my shoulder. And cavalierly, I just turned around and said, oh, Mr. Hall, you don't have to worry about it. I'm not going to quit. That guy got up from his desk, walked up to me, grabbed me by the lapels, and I said, I said, man, don't quit. We need this message. I said, I'm not going to go <laughs> That type of dinner power that they want to give to somebody, that type of thing. So. Last but not least. Yes. yes. What are you going to talk about tomorrow? Huh? What are you going to speak about tomorrow? I'm going to speak about the four major principles of success. So Napoleon Hill came up with 17 surefire principles of success, but he tells you that the first four are more important than anything else. Definiteness of purpose, mastermind, applied faith, and going the extra mile. Some interesting and fascinating stories. There's nothing to fear. You're as good as the best, as strong as the mightiest too. You can pass any battle or test, for there's no one just like you. There's only one you in the world today, so nobody else you see can do your work in just a fine way. You're the only you'll to be. There's nothing to fear. You can and you will, for you're the invincible you. So set your foot on the highest hill. There's nothing you cannot do. Great. Hey. Dr. Kimbrough, you, you, you touched on a lot, but but I want you to go go back to this to this digital divide because we we're in an information age. But I'm but I'm hearing you say that we're not taking advantage of the information. What are some of the things that we should be doing? We take, well, hey, listen, we, we take advantage in the wrong way. There is no ethnic group more than black women. Go ahead and look at the data. Go 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 to Nielsen. Google Nielsen, and they will give you all the data on anything that you want between Nielsen and the Census Bureau. No group except black females between the ages of 13 and 19 use more cell phone minutes. So I have no problem with that. Baby doll, if you got a cell phone and you want there's only two things you can do on that cell phone. Number one, you can gather information. I don't care what time of day that you boot on on that cell phone, whether it's 2 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Are you ready for this? No matter what time you boot up, there are two billion other people online with you. Now you can use that audience. You can use that audience of two billion other people to share your idea, to share your vision, to start a business, to talk about your product or service. Or you can use that two billion people to go ahead and gossip, and that's what we are doing. Now I have no problem with that. If you got a cell phone and you want to go on Facebook and you want to go Real Housewives of Atlanta and you want to gossip, that's your business. You go do your business. I'm not here to judge people. I don't judge people. I, I relate to people. But I have a big problem when you're giving your money away to AT&T to Sprint and I have black kids walking into my class saying, Dr. Kimbrough, I won't see you next semester. Why, baby doll? My mama can't afford the tuition. I got a big problem with that. You got to leverage that. So if you're going to spend your money with AT&T, well, damn it, I got to see some Verizon or AT&T scholars in my classroom. I got to see it. I got to see some Sprint scholars in my classroom. I got to see some T-Mobile scholars going to CAU on full ride in my classroom. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is not yet a question. Um, yes, brother. Uh, man, I have so many questions. The brother just kept dropping so much information. It's hard to select which one to expound on. But um, I actually, I wanted you to touch more on 
the inferiority complex that ideally our people suffer from, which makes them refuse to accept their own power base. What you're speaking on or what I've gathered from what you're speaking on is in order for the black community to truly enforce some political power, they have to first have power resources, ownership of land, production, means of production, property, assets, et cetera, organizations. So if you can speak on how the corollary of blacks owning and using that power resource base to not only establish our nation state here, but reestablishing our motherland, Africa, how will that increase our power base and our nationhood? Well, every other ethnic group has done that. Every other ethnic group has done that. And when you look at sub-Saharan Africa, that's what they're doing right now. I mean, like I told you, the Census Bureau, what is the Census Bureau predicting? Just like you got folks from all around, black folks from all around the country flocking to Atlanta. Girl, I'm going to Atlanta. Atlanta's got it going on, man. They say you get Atlanta on Monday and you can have a job on Tuesday. Well, and like I said, in the next decade, all that nonsense is going to disappear. They're not going to say, I'm coming to Atlanta. Man, I'm going to Johannesburg. Man, I'm, I'm going to Lagos, man. They said, man, they got it going in Kenya. Man, we have got to organize our capital. And it begins, Booker T. Washington said it years ago, start where you are with what you have, knowing that what you have is plenty enough. No one is going to do it for us. Now, you can walk hat in hand. You can say, oh, woe is me. You, know, you can do all that, but no one's going to feel sorry for you. Now, there are ten different forms of wealth. I explain it to my business students all the time. They make the mistake thinking that money is the only form of wealth. And I tell them, I said, money is not even number one. As a matter of fact, money is number three. And they say to me, Dr. Kimber, how come money is the number one, number one? What is the number one form of, of money? The number one, excuse me, the number one form of wealth is knowledge. And why is knowledge number one? Because the pocketbook can't grow until the mind grows. You take the word capitalism, and capitalism is not a dirty word. If you got a problem with capitalism, then you better go to Ghana. Then you better, go, I mean, you better go to Nigeria. I mean, they have no problems with capitalism over there. You take the word capitalism, write it on a piece of paper. C a p i t a l i s m. Take the Latin derivative of the word capitalism. C a p u t. Caput. Well, what does caput mean in Latin? It means head. What's the one thing you must use in order to survive in a free and open society? You must use your head. I mean, our society is not divided between rich versus poor or black versus white, liberal, conservative, Republican, Democrat, male versus female. Hell no. Our society is divided between dreamer versus non-dreamer. And people get in trouble in life not because they wanted too much. They get in trouble in life because they settled for too little. Where do ideas come from? An idea comes from your creator knocking on your subconscious, asking you, do you want more out of life? The average individual in our society gets four ideas a year, any one of which, if you had the guts, if you had the courage, if you had the fortitude to chase your dream, would make you financially independent. And all you got to do is look at Lisa Price, a Carol's daughter. I mean, the... the over a seven-year period, I know that I interacted with minimum 1,000 black millionaires. When Martin Luther King led the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955, you had only five black millionaires in the United States. You got 35,000 today. You got five black billionaires today. But unlike other ethnic groups, we turn a deaf ear. We think, oh, they were lucky. Yo, you think they were lucky? You need to tell that to Dave Stewart, who's one of your five black billionaires. You need to tell that to Tyler Perry. I asked Tyler Perry, I said, Tyler, how in the world did you go from sleeping in your car in New Orleans and sleeping in your car in Atlanta, Georgia, to building a $145 million production studio? He said to me, nothing but the grace of God. I spent two days with Kathy Hughes, one of your black billionaires. When she bought her first radio station for the first year, she slept on the floor of that radio station in Washington, D.C., and down the hall of her radio station was a restroom. She and her son bathed in that restroom and ate off a hot plate every day. There I am with Bishop T.D. Jakes, and I'm in his book line study looking at every book on God's green earth that you ever want to read or study or examine in your life. 
And what in the world do we know about Bishop Jakes? Well, number one, they told him he would never make it in the ministry because he has a heavy lisp. Number two, he's a high school dropout. Yeah, he went back and got his GED, but the man never finished high school. And number three, they damn near ran him out of Charleston, West Virginia with only three members. But you look at Jake's right now. I mean, come on, 191,000 square foot, mega church, 30,000 members, $45 million budget. And I said to him, right. I said, Bishop, I'm not getting on that plane and flying back to Atlanta until we talk about wealth and prosperity. He says, that's easy. He said, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. But show him how he can buy the pond and no one in his family will ever know struggle. Well, I'm telling your listeners today, hey, we got to buy the pond. Quit moaning. Quit, quit begging. Quit complaining. Get up off your knees and buy the damn pond. You got the money, and all we need are a few good brothers. That's all we need. That's all we need. All grown up ain't afraid of nothing, brother. No, it's time to step forward and save my race, brother. Bathe the children, get them ready for school the next day, brother. Yes, Keep sir. your butt at home because that's where you want to be, brother. Put the video game down and damn it, read a book, brother. Never call a black woman out of her name, brother. Attend the PTA meeting, brother. All we need are a few good brothers. Now, listen, I've been married 42 years to the same sister. And I know everybody's not going to be married. and Sometimes mom and daddy got to go their separate ways. But that doesn't change a thing. I'm talking about a brother who will pay the child support, pay it on time, in the right amount, with a little extra thrown in, brother. That's what we need right now, and no one's going to do that for us but us. Yes, sir. Uh, I agree with you on your analysis of the the overabundance of black wealth, the the billionaires that exist amongst us here and abroad. But, uh, my brother, I ask you uh, dialectically, how do you answer to the reverse of that, because this sounds like the old uh, argument or debate of white capitalism versus black capitalism, and ideally in the black revolutionary analysis, there really can truly never be any black capitalism because we don't own or control social, political, economic means of production in order to subjugate an entire... Yeah, well, you, you, don't, you don't need that. But, you don't no, need no, to control no, that. I'm not you don't, you don't, you, you don't need to control that. All you, all you need to do is control the means of production. That's all you exactly. need to control. <laughs> what I'm asking you, brother, is yeah. what I'm asking you is how do we get our people to not focus on that word capitalism, which what I just explained has traumatized our people into having a reactionary um, mentality and basically. We have a an acceptance of it's like this during uh, the church establishment of slavery. They made us believe it was a divine thing to accept slavery. So we feel holier than thou if we sacrifice ourselves. Mm-hmm. Now, mm-hmm. when we hear capitalism, we almost think that in order for us to seek possessions or claim wealth and stability and financial security, that that is something that we should not do because it's well, the, the not bottom, the bottom line, right to people. The we bottom need our line, culture back, brother. Yeah, yeah. Culturally, how do you answer the uh, economic question of the black man and woman here in America? Because how this do they is correlate? A, let me tell you, here, right. here is the formula for wealth, and I want you to burn it in your subconscious and share it to all your friends that tweet it, whatever you do. Here is the formula for wealth. Q plus Q plus M-A equals C. The quality of your service plus the quantity of your service plus the mental attitude in which it is rendered always equals compensation. Service is the price you pay for the space that you occupy and anybody can serve. Now, I know that we come from different religious backgrounds, but the books that I read, and I read them all, the Torah, the Talmud, uh, the Quran, I read them all. But who will be the greatest among you? Your greatest server, those who serve the most. And that formula will never wane. That formula will never go out of style. But the opposite will get you confused, and we have been confused for so long. The opposite is that somebody else will take care of you. Somebody, oh, you don't have to serve. As a matter of fact, you don't even have to work. I'll take care of you. 
You can just set up and you can have all the children that you want. And you can, listen, I'll give you a house and I'll put you in a right. little apartment and I will give you all the trappings and I'll give you food, shelter, and clothing. And you don't have to do anything else to earn it. That's the opposite of that, and that never works, and that's what we have been bought into. And that's what the three greatest social ills ever heaped on the back of my race have all come from the federal government. Number one, slavery. Number two, Jim Crow. And number three, the welfare state. That burden has been placed on our back. Now, how in the world did Africa go from colonialism to socialism, to emerging markets. They threw those shackles off left and right. They're saying, oh, my God, look at the oil. I mean, I don't care I don't care if you go to Nigeria. I don't care whether you go to Zambia. I, I don't care whether you go to Tanzania. I don't care whether you go to Angola. I don't care, care whether you go to Cape Verde Islands. And you look at all the natural resources there. That's how they changed that. Now, you got... You got five black billionaires in the United States. You got 16 in Africa, and they are making their voices heard. As a matter of fact, I was in Chicago about three weeks ago on a panel. Uh, they brought me in on a panel with a sister. This is one of the baddest sisters in the planet in Nigeria. She owns her own oil company. You need to check her out. Folaruza Alakajia, bad sister. She ain't even 50 years old. You want you you want to you know get on her level. Well, you got to speak her language. And what is her language? Girlfriend doesn't lose money. She's got too many things to do. She got people to educate. She's got to build institutions. She's one of the sixteen black billionaires in Africa, and she's making a difference. Flew in from Nigeria on her own private jet. Brought her entourage with her. She said, "No, you don't send me a commercial airline ticket. I come in on my own jet." Now, the problem is, if she walked into your studio right now, would you know her? And I'm, I'm just being, I'm speaking rhetorically. That's the problem. Right. That's the problem. There's only two qualities that you need if you're going to make it, and you're going to make it big. You need innovation, and you need creativity. What in the hell is creativity? The ability to come up with an idea. I took a shower this morning before I went up on campus. I got 50 million ideas in that shower. But you also need innovation. What is innovation? The ability to execute that idea. You see, anybody can see down the street. I can walk down Peachtree Street. I can walk up and down that campus, and I can look at the young folks. Oh, they're wearing this type of, you know, attire, and the ladies are dressed that way. See, anybody can spot a trend. But right. what we need today, we need folks who can see around the corner. We need some folks who can create a trend, who can see right. the trend. Mm-hmm. That's what Damon That's John, right. when, I, when I interviewed Damon John, I said, I said, Damon, if you had to do it all over again, would you do, what would you do? He said, man, I would have gone to college, got my degree in marketing. I said, what was the defining moment in your life? What was the high water mark in your life? He said, when I had to burn the furniture. I said, what do you mean hmm. burn the furniture? He said, well, when I finally got financing from Samsung, I went out and I hired all these seamstresses, and they showed up on my mother's house with all their equipment, and I didn't have any place to put their equipment. So I took all the furniture out of my mother's house, put it in the backyard, and set it on fire. Mm. Do you hear what I said, my brother? That's faith. Yes, sir. That's you deep. see, it starts off with belief. Then when you see somebody else do it, it turns into faith. But when you have the knowledge, it turns into spirit. And that's the track that we got to run on. Belief, faith, and spirit. we got to expose the next generation. Enough is enough. That's what I'm talking about. You sound like Dr. Khaled Muhammad in his last lecture when he said, enough Negro stuff, revolution is the only solution. Doc, talk to us about about the, the quote-unquote ghetto mentality or what we see uh, in, in many of our urban areas, what they call the hood mentality, because a lot of times the youngsters, their, their intellect or light is there, but the environment seems to snuff out their drive. How do, we, how do they ri rise up, or what can we do to overcome that? That well, you, 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 you're, looking, you're looking at the lowest form of achievement. You see, the lowest form of achievement is survival. 
You know, I go into the, the neighborhood and I speak to the brothers, what's up, man? I'm just trying to make it. Man, if I had your hand, I'd throw mine in. Man, I'm a, I'm a squirrel in your world. I'm just trying to find enough. Man, I'm day to day, right. man. You see, that's survival. But the highest point of survival is called legacy. You see, when it's all said and done, what will others say about you? And what we got to do, we got to get off of survival and we gotta take the, 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 the we gotta take the light off ourselves and put it on the next generation. You see, when I interviewed John Johnson of Ebony Magazine, and I interviewed this man twice, and there I am in his offices before he died, and I said, Mr. Johnson, can we talk about success and achievement? He says, Well, you know, success and achievement is like a relay race. I said, What do you mean, Mr. Johnson? He said, A relay race isn't one a loss on how fast the runners are. A relay race is one a loss on how capable one runner can pass the baton from one to the next. And he said, in black America, we got fastest runners in the world. In lane number one, we got Colin Powell. In lane number two, we got Oprah Winfrey. In lane number three, we got, uh, you know, hey, Michelle Obama. Men and women who have run the race of their lives. Now, they're coming around this final turn, coming down this straightaway, holding this baton called success, leadership, and achievement. But we've got to make sure that the next generation is fit, focused, ready to run the race of their lives. And I'm not so sure we've done that. I'm not so sure we've done that. Now, everybody on Clark Atlanta's campus knows my classroom. Why do they know that my classroom? Because i got a sign on my door. And you know what that sign reads? That sign exactly. says, if you don't want to work hard, you don't belong here. And if you don't want to lead, under no circumstances walk through my door. Then if you have the guts, if you got the temerity, if you got the ganyas, if you got the you know, if you got the fortitude to actually step into my classroom, the first thing you do when you turn to the right, you see another sign on that wall. And that says mediocrity is not the standard in this class. Now you can be mediocre someplace else, but damn it, you can't be mediocre here. Why? This is the standard, my brother. I will never listen, I don't demand excellence. I insist upon excellence. Now, who taught me that? Percy Sutton, who was Malcolm X's personal attorney when I interviewed right. him years ago. You never That's right. lower your standards. You never lower the bar. You just show the brothers and sisters how they can clear the bar and help them. Mm, 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 mm. I'll never lower the bar. Because if I lower the bar, I'll wipe you out. Go ahead. I'll wipe you out. Go ahead. Go ahead. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Let's take, take a couple of phone calls here. We also, Sister Donnie, if you got a question, jump right on in here because I hear you. Uh, let's go to the first call here, Eric Cole, 504 432. 504 432. You're on live with Black Power Radio. And Dr. Dennis Kimbrough, talk to us. We're talking about unlocking the black genius. Black Power, welcome. Black Power, Black Power. Uh, Brother Dennis Kimball, matter of fact, I had I had your book, Think and Grow Rich, from a black choice, but I'm going to have to go and buy that again. I see <laughs> you, and I'm going to have to go buy it again. Uh, you and Dr. Claude Anderson opened up my eyes to the economic situation amongst uh, blacks. Now, this is a question that I want to say uh, about the genes. Uh, I, I really believe, uh, do you believe uh, they should have people like you, yourself, and Claude Anderson to bring that genius out of some of our people. Well, ge- genius is innate. It was given to you upon birth. All you got to okay. do is step into the light. Because when you step into the light, two things happen. When you step into the light, you're going to raise consciousness. And when you raise consciousness, you're going to raise your standard of living. I mean, what does your Lord and Savior say? If I be lifted up, I draw all men and women unto me. He's not talking about physical. Turn your back on the physical and look at the mental. The Bible says the first shall be last and the last shall be first. What the hell does that mean? Well, we live in a society that values the physical. Until I see the BMW, until I see the $300,000 house, until I see the Air Jordans, I won't believe it. Well, the Bible says the physical that you have first, put last. And the mental that you have last, put first. Because everything occurs to you twice in life. First the inner, then the outer. First the thought then the thing, first the mental, and then the physical. And that's what we have got to do. We put too much emphasis on the physical. And you look at our buying habits. Everything's about the physical. 
I mean, you look at black males. Black males are 6% of the population. We buy more than one out of five pairs of Nike shoes that they manufacture. Did you hear what I said? We yes, are 6% sir. of the population. We buy more than 20% of Nike shoes. Now, I'm not saying if you want to buy Nikes and the Air Jordan and LeBron James, be my guest. Hey, I'll give you a ride to Foot Locker. Go in there, buy all the shoes that you want. But I have a problem when I interviewed Harry Johnson. See, we don't even know who Harry Johnson is. He's the brother who raised the $120 million for the King Memorial. And he, it took him seven years to raise the $120 million. And when I interviewed him and he told me who gave to that memorial and who didn't, now I got a problem. Soon as he took controls of the King Memorial, General Motors stepped to the table and gave $10 million. He asked Tommy Hilfiger for $5 million. Hilfiger said, I'm not going to give you $5 million. I'm going to give you $6.5 million. Toyota gave $2 million. Honda gave $2 million. But are you ready for this? Nike and Adidas didn't give him a dime. Nike and Adidas told him no. Man. When you buy 20% of those shoes, and then they're going to tell you no? Hmm. Black women, you are 6% of the population. You buy 27% of all shoes and cologne manufactured here in the United States. Hmm. Now, I got three daughters. I don't tell them what to buy and how to spend the money. Go ahead. I have no problem. But if you're going to buy the red bottom shoes, red, you know, the red bottom shoes, some of the kids who walk in my classroom got to be going to school on the red bottom shoe academic scholarship four year full ride. Every other ethnic group does that. We don't do it. We are 6% of the population. We buy more than 30% of movie theater tickets. More than 30% of movie theater tickets. How many kids are walking into my classroom on the Warner Brothers Scholarship? None. How many kids in my classroom on the King Gate Scholarship? None. How many kids are going to graduate the second week of May and they had a full-ride, four-year Universal Studio Scholarship? None. You look foolish, and no one wants to look foolish. Hmm. You look foolish. I don't want you to look foolish. Every other ethnic group does that. And they'll do it. They'll tell you to a face. You think I'm kidding? Go ahead and start a business in the Asian community and tell me, tell me the results of it. Just walk into the Asian community and tell them, you're going to start a hair care business. You'd be, lucky to be, you'd be lucky to come out in one piece. It's real talk. No one huh? wants to look foolish. Yeah. Will you raise your level of vision? You see, see with your mind's eye, my brother, because your physical eye will lie to you. If we stood on railroad tracks and we looked down the tracks, the train tracks, you would say, Dr. Kimbrough, looks like the, the tracks are coming together. But the tracks never come together, otherwise the train would fall off the tracks. You come to, to Georgia, and let's go, let's go to Savannah and look out across the Atlantic Ocean. You would say, man, it looks like the sky and the water meet. Well, the sky and the water never meets because there would be no such thing as gravity if the sky and the water meet. You see, those are two examples of your physical lie lying to you. But when you get a dream and you get a vision, and you say, damn it, enough is enough. This I will do. This I will have. This I will become. The revolution starts right now. See with your mind's eye. I say, I say. Yes, yes sir, brother. Did that answer your question? Oh, I want, and I want to say this, too. Uh, uh, sure. Does he uh, plan on writing a book with uh, um, Claude Anderson? Claude Anderson hooking up. Yeah, that that would be a good idea, <laughs> man. I uh, I'm I'm working on book number six right now, so um, only so many hours in the day, my brother. That that sounds like a good idea, but there's enough. I I try to leave a legacy between. I've written five books between Think and Grow Rich or Black Choice and The Wealth Choice. We just got to spread it. Got to put those right. books in as many hands as possible. Thanks for the call, right. my brother. All right, I'm going to go get that book again now. 
Oh, I love you so much. You hang in there, my brother. All right, my brother. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much for that call. Uh, we'll go to another call here. Eric Cole, it's 314-650, 314-650. You're on live. This is Black Power Radio. We're talking to Dr. Dennis Kimbrough, and we're talking about unlocking the black genius. Talk to us. Welcome. Get into it. Black Power. Call 314-650. You there? Might have lost signal. Next call here, Eric Code is 765-717-765-717. You're on live. This is Black Power Radio, Unlocking the Black Genius. Dr. Dennis Kimbrough, talk to us. We're trying to get to it. Black Power. Hey, hey what's going on, Brother Quality? This is Brother Wise, man. What's happening? Hey, and, uh, hey, hey, Brother Wise. Hey, it's, it's, it's a real coincidence that I just so happened to get on this call because you're on the phone with it. Like you got a, a brother on the line. You know, I'm with this, I'm, I was going to Clark Atlanta University. Things didn't work out. But my question to the brother is uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to school in a predominantly white area. My college, I go to Ball State University. And it's really a lack of uh, Afrocentricity or, or, you know, our culture. And what I did was I went and got me uh, some cocoa beads with a black fish on them, and I went and got me, you know, uh, some, uh, some other decorative African things. And I started walking around with this on, and I get a bad, I get a bad vibe from these white people up here. But how do I get these brothers and sisters, this in college, the ones that I that I got a hold of, and they really want to organize with me? How do I get their mind state focused on uh, being uh, all the way indulged in our culture and not being afraid of it in front of these white folks? Because in my area, it's more than them than it is us. Yeah, well, you you can't control that. You got to be the change that you want to be. You 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 got to be the catalyst. You can't worry about uh, who's siding with you or who's you know in your camp or on your side. You can't worry about that. You have got to be the change. You know, the the first thing I do, the the first class, and and one thing you will never find about me. Okay, I've been teaching. I've been at Clark Atlanta since '92. And you will never find any of the books that I've written on my syllabus. I'm not there to hawk books on my students. Now, my students will go to the bookstore. They'll get all my books, come, and Dr. Kimber, will you autograph this for my mama, for my auntie? Okay, that, that's fine. Now, I've written business cases, and I always use my cases, but I'm not there to hawk books with my students. So the first day of class, what's the first handout I give my students after the syllabus? I give them the four greatest prayers. And I get business soon. What got, what's it got to do with business? I said, not a damn thing. But years from now, when you chase your dream, I don't care whether you're going to become an entrepreneur or a corporate climber, and life knocks you to your knees, here is food for the journey. Then number two, I tell everybody, pull out a piece of paper and write down the number 30 on that piece of paper, and I want you to look at it day in and day out. And what's the number 30? That's Martin Luther King. Over the course of his adult life, this man averaged 30 racial prank-filled phone calls every day of his life. The phone would ring, he would pick it up, nigga, I'm going to kill you, hang it up. The phone would ring, he would pick it up, nigga, I know where you live, hang it up. The phone would <laughs> ring, nigga, 30 prank-filled, but it never stopped him. It never stopped him. So you've got to be the change, and you can't control that. You can't. You know, the the subtitle to both of my books, Think and Grow Rich, A Black Choice, and The Wealth Choice. There are 50 million different choices that you can make on a daily basis. You can choose what time you're going to eat lunch, who you're going to eat lunch with, what you're going to wear, what stage you're going to watch the game tonight. 99.9% of these choices you can turn your back on, you don't have to address. But there are two choices that you must face as soon as your feet hit the ground first thing in the morning. Number one, you can accept the circumstances as they are. Or number two, you can take the responsibility to change them. And what I found over the course of my research on my books, those men and women who have won mostly in life have relied mostly on themselves. They made the choice. And I bring successful, I parade successful men and women in front of my students all the time. You know who spoke in my class last week? I had three individuals speak to my students last week. Number one, Dikembe Mutombo. 
You may or may not know him. You might have seen the Geico commercials. You know he played in the NBA. Dikembe Mutombo. Now you say, oh, Dr. Kimbo, he's an athlete. No, he went to Georgetown on an academic scholarship. After his freshman year, John Thompson approached him and told him to try out for the team. He's 7'2". He said, you ever play basketball? He said, no, not really. I'm here and I'm a pre-med student. He said, try out for the team. You might make it. And he made the team. Do you know the businesses that he owns? Do he, he shared his portfolio with my students. Do you know what's in his portfolio? He said, you've got to go long and far in inner city Atlanta. All of these hospitals, find me a hospital in Atlanta that I don't own the ambulances that go in and out of those emergency rooms. He said, I own oil wells in Nigeria. I built schools in Nigeria. I built a hospital in Kinshasa. He said, I own 34% of the African Channel, which is equal to BET here in the United States. And he says, the only reason why I was able to accomplish that, I made a choice to do it. 